Okay, welcome back to this uh, fifth uh, sub video on uh, the third lecture on equivalent graph neural networks. So what we've done so far, we have explained the message passing framework, how to make them equivalent and how to work with steerable features in 3D. So what I want to do in the remaining videos is show some examples of the, well, of the stuff that we learned and how it's applied in practice, going over some papers. Um, that are of the steerable kind, a uh, steerable group convolution kind in a, a message passing framework. So what I've been doing so far is explaining that in this message passing framework, we want to uh, condition the messages on attributes, on geometric attributes, such as uh, distances or displacement factors uh, between uh, atoms, for example. And I explained that this sort of categorizes these methods into types that can be thought of as uh, linear convolutions versus those that can be thought of as maybe nonlinear convolutions where the messages are obtained in a very nonlinear way and here they obtained in a way that you see in convolutions typically with linear transformations of neighborhood uh, features. And the idea is that these transformations were conditioned on attributes. And then uh, when we talk about the equivalent case, we make a distinction between uh, well, regular group convolutions, so uh, convolutional neural networks that work with scalar fields, and then we can only work with invariants, such as uh, distances between uh, nodes, um, or we lift it to the group, and then we still have like a regular group convolution type uh, operator acting with scalars, but where when there's no, uh, in this case, there are no constraints on the quantities that we want to uh, condition our operators on. Uh, but if we want to stick to the planar or let's say the R3 uh, case, then we enter the steerable uh, paradigm. So now our quantities, uh, these AIJs, can be conditioned on, um, I'm sorry, I mean these, these operators can now also be conditioned on equivariant or covariant uh, quantities such as displacement factors or spherical harmonic embeddings of uh, displacement factors. And our features can now also be not just scalar values, but uh, features or factors that transform form under uh, the irreducible representations of SO3. And then we enter so the steerable uh, convolutional paradigm. And they relate to each other to regular group convolutions via uh, a Fourier transform. All right, and then also in this uh, steerable setting, we can think of a nonlinear uh, counterpart where the messages are obtained by MLPs, which are uh, well nonlinear operators in themselves. And we we showed how to make them equivalent based on this uh, Klebsch gordon tensor product. So what I'm going to do in this talk focus on um, neural networks of um, mostly the, the the linear kind based on the steerable features. So we're going to take a look at steerable uh, graph neural networks. And while doing so, I'm going to make use of uh, this paper as a reference, because that's where we uh, sort of started off this analysis or uh, dichotomy of uh, equivalent graph neural networks in, into linear versus nonlinear and equivalent versus uh, non-equivalent. Uh, so let, let's have a quick look at this paper. So this is uh, the paper that I mentioned. It's now published at iClear. And I'm showing it because the the the, um, the videos on equivalent graph neural network so far uh, have been following roughly the structure of this paper, where we start off with explaining uh, the message passing uh, framework, um, talk about this notion of steerable features and how they are transformed via uh, the Wigner D matrices, and that our objective is to make equivalent multilayer perceptrons. We talk about how to uh, come up with equivalent, um, let's say, attribute embeddings of uh, displacement factors, how they are steerable, um, and of course the klebsch gordon tensor product. And then we um, introduce this idea that indeed a partially evaluated klebsch gordon tensor product, evaluated for a particular attribute A, can be thought of as a conditional uh, linear layer, a linear layer conditioned on uh, this attribute. Uh, and so, okay, so once we do that, we go over related work, just like I'm going to now do now in this uh, uh, video. Um, yeah, starting off with this introduction of the, the convolution operator as a linear transformation of neighborhood, uh, neighboring features. Um, yeah, leading to this idea of messages that are linear transformations of, of neighbor uh, features. And these messages are typically then conditioned on a displacement fa uh, factor, like a relative uh, position. Um, yeah, and so, and when we um, expand our convolution kernels in a steerable basis, then we're going to make this distinction that the steerable basis um, 
it, well, it's a steerable basis. So it, it takes us input these equivalent uh, quantities, um, but the weights themselves can still be in turn conditioned on invariance. Uh, typically these weights are obtained uh, via uh, multi-layer perceptrons that take some invariant quantities as output and spit out this, these weight matrices. So once you do that, uh, we show that we can link these uh, linear transformations or these convolution type messages to a steerable framework where we have uh, linear transformations that are conditioned on this invariance and well, let's say preconditioned via this Klebsch Gordon tensor product on these steerable uh, quantities. Okay, and then once we've introduced this notation, it becomes a bit easier to connect all these different types of methods that are out there, um, covering indeed the, the linear uh, steerable convolution type methods, as well as their um, pseudo nonlinear counterparts, the attentive uh, convolutions ones, as well as, uh, well, for reference, we also go over regular uh, group convolutions, which, we're, which I'm going to cover in the next uh, uh, video, actually. All right, and then finally, we propose this, this nonlinear counterpart of the steerable methods via um, well, steerable uh, MLPs. Uh, so that's then uh, given over here. And then we start doing experimentations and discuss the results in terms of this uh, linear versus nonlinear and steerable versus uh, regular group, group convolutions. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to use this table as a reference because it gives me a nice set of, of papers. And yeah, I'll pick some, some of them out to, to discuss in, in further detail. So let's go back to the slide deck. And here I must mention, of course, that this list of references was uh, by time of publication, like uh, a relevant list of, of, of related works tested on the QM9 data set. We also test on different benchmarks, but against different references. So please do not consider this as a comprehensive study of all literature out there. But I do think it's a nice a starting point to uh, to start your search on, well, your literature survey and understand what is being done out there. Because most of these methods are also applied in different scenarios and uh, compared against, well, uh, similar methods. Okay, and all these methods uh, which we compare against are indeed equivalent and they can be thought of as message passing neural networks. And that uh, allows us to talk about, well, equivalent message passing, so convolution type um, um, architectures where we make a distinction between methods that work with scalar features. So we think of them as uh, regular group convolutions or regular convolutions and steerable features. Now, why do I think of them as uh, group convolutions anyway, even when their base domain is for example, uh, R3? It's because in lecture 1.7, we said that any equivalent linear layer between uh, feature maps on homogeneous spaces is a group convolution. And sometimes this means that we have to impose a kernel constraint on the kernels, right? Which was the case with uh, the SNET or these point conf uh, type uh, neural networks. Okay, so that's uh, what I showed in this uh, list. So we can think of them as equivalent convolutions uh, acting on some base space, maybe R3 or maybe lifted to the full group. So we really have group convolution neural networks, either of the steerable or the regular kind. Um, but there are also some methods um, which I think are really interesting. They can be thought of as nonlinear, nonlinear group convolutions on a homogeneous space of positions and orientations. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that in, in the next lecture. So now we're going to focus on the steerable methods. And when you talk about steerable methods for molecular data, I think these two sources like tensor field neural networks and cormorants are really the starting point uh, for your search on which many methods actually build or expanded uh, variations uh, of. So let me start off with uh, the, the, the tensor field uh, networks uh, paper. Okay, so in this paper, they present a method for rotation and translation equivalent neural networks for uh, 3D point clouds written by uh, uh, Nathaniel Thomas and Tess uh, Smith. And I think those are really, I guess, key figures in this, this uh, steel uh, framework where Tess Smith is one of the main contributors to this E3 and N uh, library. All right, yeah, I think this, this paper is a very good starting point uh, for, for further reading. It gives a very nice exposition of these uh, steerable methods, uh, starting off indeed with related work, which we've also discussed by now, like harmonic networks for 2D steerable methods, SNET for uh, invariant uh, point cloud uh, operations. Um, yeah, going over uh, the core of representation theory, um, and desirable uh, properties such as permutation, equivalence, 
translation equivariance and rotation equivariance and how especially this rotation equivariance is achieved via these Wigner D matrices. Um, yeah, and then they're going to explain that mappings between such steerable features that transform via the Wigner Ds um, are obtained via the Klebsch Gordon tensor product and that uh, these spherical harmonic uh, embeddings they, they provide a steerable basis uh, for the convolution kernels. And I actually learned a lot from reading this paper for the, for the first time. And you see that in my lectures, I am sticking quite closely to the notations that they use in this paper. For example, here they explain also the Klebsch Gordon tensor product, which we just covered in the previous uh, video, and also gave this example of any different types of Klebsch Gordon tensor products, such as inner products or uh, cross uh, products. So we covered all these tools in the, in the previous uh, lectures. So the main idea here is that now we can build um, our message passing uh, layers. So what we're looking at over here is uh, a message passing layer of a convolution type. So we have a point cloud of, of atoms indexed with, with A, we have a channel index C, and we have different feature types, right? So these LIs, is, that's the type of the, the representation of the feature, and MI are its uh, components. So what do you do with message passing? You aggregate over your neighborhood. So Bs are the neighbors of, of the atom. These Vs are uh, the neighboring uh, feature vectors. And then the Klebsch Gordon tensor product sums over all the components in these vectors. Via a Klebsch Gordon tensor product with, um, let's say, um, a steerable feature or attribute embedding. So I'm going to uh, detail this in a minute. But you'll see this message passing form, right? Where this is the aggregation step, and this part are uh, the messages. And they somehow depend on the geometric attributes, uh, which are encapsulated in this, this filter, in this convolution kernel, which you see depends on this displacement uh, vector, uh, the difference between the atom uh, positions. So linking this back to the, the group convolution uh, uh, framework, these, these filters over here, so these uh, filters, as a function of their displacement factors, they're defined uh, over here. So I suppose we have such a filter as a function of on R3, it's decomposed into uh, a basis functions, these spherical harmonic uh, basis functions, or steerable basis function, and a part that only depends on the radial part. So also here we have this, um, this polar uh, decomposition. Okay, so that shows that this main layer is indeed of a uh, convolution type. So we have linear transformations via this Klebsch Gordon tensor product of neighboring feature vectors. But what is also worth noting here is that um, this radial part of the filter or the filter as a whole only has this channel index. So these filters are actually mappings from R3, so convolution kernels that map to assign to each relative displacement vector uh, C dimensional, C dimensional, um, well, uh, kernel value. So it doesn't spit out a full transformation matrix C in to C out. It only spits out uh, the C out. And this tells us that actually in the convolution operator itself, um, they're not doing any mixing uh, between channels. And we see that actually quite enough, uh, quite often and actually more often also in the computer vision domain we have this separability of uh, the convolution operator where only let's say spatial interactions are encoded via the convolution filters and then the mixing between channels or feature vectors is done separately via channel mixing uh, step and that's being done here in the self interaction uh, step so in this part we do have channel mixing or feature value mixing. And here in this convolution part, we do not have that. So actually these two together provide what you would call depth-wise separable convolutions. And this is what makes this entire framework uh, or convolutions in general really uh, much faster. And this is like when you use, for example, torch and the conf2d operator is like using the groups uh, option of uh, these operators. So if you have uh, conf2d with all the specs, you specify something like groups is, and I don't know actually how to 
precisely specify this, but this is, if you look at the torch ConvTD operators, you have this groups options, uh, which you can use to make sure that the convolution operator only acts on each C channel separately, but there's no mixing between channels in this operator in itself. And that uh, leads to huge, huge uh, efficiency gains, both in number of parameters and, and, and in speed. And this idea of depth-wise separal convolution is nicely explored in this paper by uh, Francois Cholet. Okay, so we identified that we're looking here at separable group convolutions, steerable group convolutions, and the, the non-linearities that are being used here are of, uh, well, let's say the norm type. Recall this lecture where I talked about equivalent uh, uh, activation functions. These are activation fun functions that uh, do something with the norm or the length of my uh, steerable features. So that's uh, explained over here. Okay, so that's pretty cool. And then they uh, demoed this. This is a similar diagram that we saw in the harmonic networks papers that uh, de depending on what kind of filter you use, you can we can switch uh, to different types of uh, steerable features from scalars to uh, frequency one, uh, um, steerable feature types and back. And uh, so this is a rough sketch of their architecture and they tested it on different data sets. And if I recall correctly, this demo on, uh, for example, the classification of these Tetris uh, shapes, that's also included in uh, the E3NN uh, library. Okay, so they cover a shape classification, um, uh, a physics problem in, in classical mechanics, and uh, the chemistry problem, uh, talking about this QM9 data set. So the, the prediction of uh, quantum mechanical properties of, of small molecules. And now I don't want to go that much into uh, details on performances, I really want to provide an overview sketch of what kind of methods are out there. And this is one, a steerable graph neural network uh, methods what we just saw, which is very clearly of this uh, convolution type. And then I want to move on to the, this next seminal paper, uh, Cormorant, um, also of the steerable type. It's actually slightly uh, non-linear as I'll uh, explain in a minute, but this one is really purely tuned to this molecular setting. And it has some nice connections there. So uh, let's now have a look at this paper. Now, why I wanted to go over this paper is because it's it's a method that is uh, comes from a line of research that is sort of independent of the, the one that we saw before uh, from the group of Risi Condor. And I like this particular paper because it also gave me a lot of intuition about these steerable features and how they connect to this uh, quantum uh, chemistry uh, setting. Um, so definitely also a recommended read. And the idea is that when you talk about interactions in, in physical systems, you have different types of interactions of, and um, where type is really of, uh, <laughs> and using the language of the steerable features, a so really different, well, frequency or type of steerable feature. So we can talk about scalar interactions that are essentially invariant uh, to rotations. So meaning that if you have such a physical system and you have uh, particles and they have charges, um, then there's things like, for example, the Coulomb energy that is really in invariant uh, to rotations. And it only depends on the distance between uh, particles. So if you want to build a neural network for uh, quantum chemistry, we want at least to be able to handle these kind of interactions. But then we also have uh, things such as dipole-dipole uh, interaction. So a dipole has directional information in them, right? Um, where really they give this here this definition of a dipole moment uh, in a set of charged particles, which have a, has a center of mass, are as a relative position relative to the center of ma mass uh, weighted with these charges, right? So that, that gives us a vector, uh, so directional information there. And so, and then if you, if you want to analyze these interactions between these, uh, let's say dipole uh, moments, these, these directional uh, features, yeah, then we need to talk about interactions between between vectors. And this needs to be happening in, a, in an equivalent way. Um, but then we also have other types of quantities of higher orders. Like uh, uh, we have to talk about interactions between uh, quadrupoles. And such a quadrupole moment is the second moment of the charge density. And it's essentially a matrix. So maybe that's the essential part uh, over here. So. Again, maybe it's good to stress that I am not a computational chemist or a quantum chemist. So um, this is going already into qu quite a lot of details. But the essence here is that when 
analyzing these kind of systems of uh, these particle systems in a quantum chemical setting we have to uh, talk about different types of interactions that behave as scale scalars as vectors or as as matrices and then the important part here is that all these quantities they transform in a predictable way so these are covariant quantities if the system rotates then these invariants uh, well they stay the same these uh, dipole moments they are transformed by rotation matrices and these quadrupole moments so these matrices they transform in, a, in such a way as we have seen before so a rotation matrix on the left of this central matrix and a transpose rotation matrix on the right of uh, this matrix and we've also seen before in, in uh, the previous lecture uh, that we can f always flatten such matrices or higher order tensors and write it in such a form that uh, this quantity uh, transformed via some type of rotation matrix on the left um, so a representation of the group so and that then sets the premise for uh, this irreducible representation theory so we're now talking about representation so these are quantities that transform uh, well via representations of the rotation group and we want to write that in a convenient form so if we have a tensor product of these rotation matrices um, which you get uh, when you talk about vectors, uh, matrices, and higher order tensors, those transform via um, rotation matrices of this form, so like via tensor products of rotation matrices. And we saw that via this equivalence of representations, these representations can be decomposed into their irreducible representations or in the, in the, in the Wigner D matrices. All right, so I, th I think this paper follows a very nice, very good uh, storyline, let's say. So this whole this decomposition in irreducible representations is nice because each of these subspaces now transform independently uh, from one another. So we can focus on these small um, uh, steerable subvector spaces. Yeah, and when you talk about uh, irreducible representations, you uh, end up uh, talking with in the well, talking the same language as you would maybe in in Fourier analysis. Um, well, the spherical harmonics uh, uh, end up over here. But what I wanted to show actually is, um, of course, also this thing that if we have a tensor product of irreducible representations, then these decomposes again into EREPs where these C's are the Klebsch Gordon tensor, uh, or sorry, the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. Right? These Klebsch Gordon tensor products, they encode for this uh, change of basis whilst performing uh, this tensor product. And in this change of basis, um, the, the, the vectors transform via these uh, block diagonal uh, representations. So that's this aspect of things, and these are the change of basis. And here coded up um, or notated as matrix valued uh, Klebsch Gordon uh, coefficients. Okay, but now maybe I'm, I'm spending a bit too much time on the, on the details again because this is covered in the previous uh, video, right? And now the important part here is that they're building, um, well, neural networks with these type of operators. And just like we discussed in lecture two, when we built uh, stable neural networks, we, and also in the ESCNN library, so I recall the, the ESCNN library, where we need to specify a uh, feature uh, types. Because these, um, the idea is that we're building convolutional neural networks on feature fields. And feature fields, where feature maps with fibers, or let's say um, feature vectors, um, which representations act on. And these feature vectors are decomposed in parts that, for example, only transform via, um, well, representation of types zero, type one, type two, etc. So you need to specify um, how these fibers transform, what kind of uh, features am I uh, considering in my hidden representations. And that links it back, of course, to um, this case that maybe well, throughout the neural network, we need to um, handle scalar interactions, we need to handle dipoles or quadrupoles. So this is a type zero uh, vector, type one, a uh, type two uh, vector. Okay, so moving on to the architecture. Uh, so these are the type of features they work with, so these steerable types, and then they talk about covariant neurons, so the actual uh, neural network layers. And there they also have to talk about the activation functions. So as a non-linearity, they mentioned that they could use, um, let's say, the usual ones, so apply an inverse Fourier transform, such that then a pointwise non-linearity can be uh, performed, and then transform it back to the resulting uh, spherical uh, tensor or the steerable uh, feature types. Because recall, we cannot just simply apply pointwise nonlinearities to the steerable features. 
We could do that only if we first do an inverse VA transform and then back. So this is already nice that they identify that option in this paper. Um, and this is actually also the approach taken in this paper by Taco Cohen on spherical uh, group convolutions, which unfortunately I haven't discussed in detail, but this is actually a really nice reference is if you want to take a look at this whole Fourier-based group convolution uh, setting. Okay, so they're, but that's basically saying they're not using this Fourier uh, setting because in their particular case, uh, going up to all sorts of different types of features, they uh, thought it to be too costly. So what they did, they incorporated a nonlinear aspect in the Klebsch coordinate tensor products uh, themselves. So instead, um, we use the Klebsch coordinate transform as a nonlinearity in itself. So let's go to their uh, main layer. So the, the two body interaction. So this is really, again, of a message passing a type where this um, feature transformation is sort of split in, in two aspects. So the one body part, so that only uh, acts on, on the scalar values and the two body part, uh, so that's uh, acting on uh, equivariant or covariant uh, quantities. So actually I'm going to get rid of this part for, for a bit because what this is, this is a feature vector which is concatenated with another uh, feature vector. And this one is of the message passing type And this one is only transforming the, the feature vectors locally. So I'm sort of get rid of this uh, for, for the moment to focus on the message passing type. Because what's happening here, we sum over J, J are the neighbors, and these are the neighboring feature values. And these are transformed via a Klebsch coordinate tensor product with some filter or some, let's say attribute embedding um, that is used to transform uh, these features. So this is like the conditional linear layer um, that we mentioned before, so this is the convolution part, and then afterwards we have this channel mixing part. So again, here we see the separability, um, where we will see that this embedding, uh, think of it as a weighted Klebsch coordinate tensor product, does not uh, perform this channel mixing. This is done afterwards. So this again leads to this huge uh, efficiency gains. Okay, so we're again looking at separable uh, group convolutions here, uh, though this is what you could think of as an attentive uh, group convolution because this G isn't entirely uh, linear or depending only on the relative displacement vectors. So this G is like a convolution filter. Okay, so it's expanded in this spheric harmonics uh, basis as, as we've seen before, which is evaluated on this normalized displacement vector. So this is a steerable embedding of an attribute. And this thing is based on invariance only. But instead of letting this G only depend on the radius, so this G is defined over here, this G depends on the radius, so the distance, uh, so that's an invariant between two uh, pairs of nodes, via a learnable, um, a learnable radius radial basis function. And this is really like a cut off, like a masking uh, function. So maybe that's not that important. Um, maybe I could omit it, but so this, this radial part of this convolution filter depends on, well, the radius, but it also depends on feature values of my current uh, feature vector and my neighboring feature vector. And these stable feature vectors are turned into scalar values via simply by an inner product, right? A dot product spits out a scalar value. So this is like an equivariant mapping from two stable feature vectors to a scalar value. So this is a certain type of the Klebsch coordinate tensor product mapping to a type zero uh, feature vector. So we have different types of invariants that we can exploit to, to condition our convolution kernel on. So the distance between these points, um, their, let's say, um, cosine similarity, right? An inner product can be thought of as a cosine similarity between their current stable feature vectors. And uh, this is also based on the the scalar embedding of uh, our representation of the, uh, well, let's say this point pair in, in the previous uh, layer. And all these invariant quantities are then mixed together by another uh, learnable weight matrix that then is responsible for this part. So if this uh, radial part would only depend indeed on the distances, then really this would be a regular 
steerable group convolution. But now this, this radio function is also depending on uh, the feature values, both at i and at j, this sort of becomes a, a pseudo uh, linear operator, which is slightly made non-linear because the convolution kernel is adapted to the pairs of, of points. So we're talking actually about a form of uh, attentive, attentive a group convolution. And this is, a, I think, a really interesting idea. So this is modifying the linear operator to something which is nonlinear. And that's also done in the, the SE3 transformer, which I'm going to discuss next. Okay, so where before I always talked about the group convolution setting, and maybe from that perspective, I think this is a nice paper that approaches this more from the, the quantum physics, quantum chemistry uh, angle, uh, talking about different types of uh, objects like uh, uh, dipole moments. Um, in the steerable uh, settings. Okay, and then of course they do some experiment on this uh, quantum chemistry uh, topics. And yeah, that won't be my focus because even though they get really brilliant results at that time, um, these charts are changing constantly. And by now, <laughs> I guess these uh, results maybe are not that impressive anymore uh, because we have, well, new state of the arts every month. But still, yeah, a great paper to get started in this uh, steerable framework. So we talked about tensor field networks and cormorant, very similar method, which is slightly uh, nonlinear. And in a similar spirit, we have this SE3 transformers, which also performs attentive convolution. So I also want to have a quick look at this paper. All right, so this is the paper, SE3 transformers, 3D rotation translation equivalent attention networks, written by Fabian Fuchs and Daniel Worrell, which we know from the harmonic network uh, paper. Um, yeah, so this is an instant also of this message passing framework. So that's nicely uh, visualized uh, over here. The task is to process these point clouds of atoms or other type of uh, particle system, right? Um, yeah, let me be brief on, on this, this paper. So they talk about attentive convolutions where between point pairs, uh, transformations are, or, or aggregation steps are modulated with an attention coefficient. And these attention coefficients are then obtained via pairwise uh, let's say similarity uh, measures. And this leads to a general formulation of, uh, let's say, uh, transformations in which the, the output feature values are obtained as a weighted sum of neighboring feature values weighted, where these weights are obtained via uh, attention uh, methods or uh, possibly augmented with convolution operators. Um, um, so yeah, so that's, I think this general idea is nicely explained in this paper by, uh, by Wang et al. Um, so here I want to focus on this, this steerable and uh, steerable convolution or attentive convolution part of things. So again, the same type of theory that we've been covering so far, so far, clip record and tensor products and steerable features. And this is then their main layer, right? Uh, a tensor field ne neural network layer. So from the tensor field network paper that we discussed essentially performs a convolution where we made this uh, discussion before where this convolution kernel, so here, here we see this message passing uh, framework, this convolution kernel is expanded in a, a basis, so which has a steerable component to it. So this depends on uh, equivariant uh, coordinates and a part that is only depending on invariant, so the distances uh, between point pairs. And if you do convolutions with such kernels, we end up with a steerable framework and the transformations are essentially performed via Klebsch coordinate tensor products. Okay, so we're here in the, the steerable group convolution framework, right? Where the main operator is this convolution operator, uh, but then they make this convolution operator slightly nonlinear by incorporating an attention coefficient that depends on both the node features at node i and at node j. So this is really a linear transformation, but it's augmented with something uh, that is non-linearly obtained from, uh, well, both uh, the current node feature and the neighboring node feature. And this makes it what you might call a pseudo-linear uh, uh, operator. Now, so what's happening here is all of the tensor field neural network type, uh, meaning that we're working with steerable feature vectors, and then from these steerable feature vector, invariants are obtained, which can be uh, used to compute attention coefficients. So this is a general idea of computing attention. So you apply a transformation on your query locations and your key, uh, key uh, locations. So basically the, the current uh, uh, feature or location and the neighboring features. So they're mapped via some uh, linear transformation tool, let's say a common space in which a similarity measure is obtained. 
And now the nice thing is why this works. So these Q's and these K's are still a steerable feature vector, feature vectors. But once you take uh, an inner product, it spits out a scalar, and this is obtained in a completely equivalent way. So the scalar vector is invariant, but the whole path to computing this uh, scalar value is uh, equivariant. So that is essentially explained here. The attention weights are invariant for the following reason, essentially because the inner product is invariant. And that's explained over here is the, if the key is rotated via some representation or the query and the key vector, then this inner product stays invariant under these uh, transformations. Okay, so I wanted to show this because this is a nice example of a nonlinear group convolution. And in the previous paper, the Cormorant paper, these attention weights were incorporated in, in these radial parts of uh, the convolution kernels uh, directly. I mean, we could also move this inside here, uh, but here they very clearly make this distinction between the regular convolution operator and the attention part. Okay, and then finally from this uh, list of papers, um, I want to go over this particular method, which is a really nice one called uh, Pain, from the same authors of Schnett. So they're pretty good at coming up with nice names for their architectures. And I actually mentioned this as maybe, yeah, is it steerable or is it a regular group convolution? I think it essentially falls in the steerable class uh, for the reason which I'm going to uh, show next. Okay, so it's this paper by uh, Christoph Schutt, the same author of uh, Schnett, this uh, point conv uh, paper where with convolutions uh, that were invariant to rotations or invariant convolution kernels. Now, uh, he deposed it also nicely in this message passing framework where uh, messages are now conditioned on these displacement vectors, right? That's the geometric quantity. That's the geometric quantity which we have at our disposal when we compute uh, these messages. And then obviously we want these message functions to be equivalent. But if we stick to invariant feature vectors, uh, feature values, like work with uh, MLP based message functions, these functions need to be invariant. Um, yeah, so they explain that this, this is kind of a restrictive. So now they are going to compute message functions that do not spit out scalar values, but could also spit out vector uh, valued features. And then these vector valued features could be obtained from message passing functions that have to be equivalent, of course, but can now also contain directional information in them. So, of course, this attribute that we have at our disposal, these are now the directional feature vectors, uh, like the, uh, we have, let's say, C channels of them, and also we have scalar valued uh, feature uh, values. Okay, so now that we talk about steerable feature vectors, like really type one uh, vectors and mappings between, uh, well, steerable vectors, we quite easily end up in this klebsch gordon tensor product or the steerable framework. And that's why I tend to call this a steerable method uh, for the following reasons. So they say, okay, the kind of operations that we're now allowed to use are the following for uh, as activation functions. Yeah, they can use any uh, nonlinear activation function on the scalar, but for uh, the vectors, they, for example, they can only mess with the norm of these, these vectors. So um, for example, gated nonlinearities, and that's indeed a valid class of equivalent activation functions as discussed in one of the, the previous uh, lectures. But then for the operations themselves, they say that um, now that we have vector valued feature vectors or scalar value feature vectors, we can do several things. For example, we can take linear combinations of these vectors that spits out again a vector, or we can take uh, scalar products, uh, so turning vectors into scalars via the inner products, or they can perform vector product like a cross product. And these are essentially all instances of the klebsch gordon uh, tensor product. So the klebsch gordon tensor product that we have seen before. All right, so this falls in a steerable class of, of graph neural networks papers. But why I'm still tempted maybe also to put it into this regular group convolution case because they also spent a lot of focus on what kind of invariants uh, can be exploited. And invariants in these molecular settings are of course the distance between atoms, which we can use to update uh, to compute message functions. But it could also be angles. If I have pairs of edges, then I can compute an angle between them, both the usual angle as well as dihedral angles. And then we have invariants. Uh, and this can actually be thought of as computing uh, group convolutions on a homogeneous space of uh, positions and directions, which I'll uh, explain a bit in uh, the next video. 
Um, but yeah, I, I do not want to spend too much time on, on this paper. Uh, I think it's a really nice paper to, to study because it sort of mixes uh, two IDs and uh, maybe this is a bit uh, too much, uh, this figure, like there's an, a lot going on here, but this is a bit of the same style as, as DimeNet. And DimeNet is running the state of the art for quite a while uh, now. Um, actually, it has been recently surpassed also by this paper, but um, the idea is that they have a very intricate uh, message passing framework and which is both efficient and only working with scalar value. It is efficient and powerful. And so this idea is also used in this paper, focusing on really optimization and therefore they also only focus on uh, scalar values and vector valued quantities. So therefore I would not maybe want to put it in this whole general framework or steerable uh, tensor field networks uh, because it's only speci specialized on these scalars and, uh, and vectors. And yeah, so they come up with a, with a brilliant uh, paper and it's, it's nice to study uh, this paper. And so. Also here they tested on different molecular uh, data set where DimeNet was running the state of the art until that point. They really, really got impressive results uh, with this kind of uh, adaptation that not only includes invariant quantities, which is done in DimeNet, but also equivariant quantities. And then you get, you know, great results. All right, finally, I want to mention that, of course, this list is a non-exhaustive list of, of papers out there. I think there's another class of steerable graph neural networks or steerable uh, neural network papers in this quantum chemistry domain uh, that can be linked to this UNITE framework. And this is a kind of technical paper, so I won't go into detail there, but it has a very nice connection to this whole classical quantum chemistry domain. So definitely read this paper, check out the appendices. Um, when you read the paper, um, there's several things going on, but of course they work with uh, steerable features or like... Um, Covariance and those transformed via Klebsch cord and tensor products. So you'll uh, notice them as well in this paper. Then there's line of work of this uh, group of people working on the E3N uh, library. Um, uh, Simon Betzner is one of them. Tess Schmidt we saw before. Um, so there's the whole uh, Mario Geiger. We also saw, saw him before on the paper on the, this, the dense uh, stable group convolutions uh, with uh, Maurice Weiler. Yeah, and so they, they, these, these groups of people can keep coming up with, with nice uh, new architectures that work really well in this computational chemistry domain, but also in um, computational physics, maybe in general. And really recently, uh, this paper came out, um, which they are saying of that it doesn't fall in the message passing paradigm and it works really well, it scales uh, super well. And it's also based on this Klebsch cord and tensor product. And now, just mentioned that it isn't of the message passing type. I don't fully agree with it. Um, I think in the end, almost everything can be framed as message passing, but it has some very interesting idea in it, which I want to quickly also discuss because that's also what we've been mentioning in the previous videos. That is, in the previous videos, I've been talking about these conditional linear layers. And I think that plays a very important role in, in this paper, though they do not analyze it specifically in that case. I do want to point to this uh, similarity. And to give just a very quick breakdown of this paper. So it, it takes its inspiration from um, this whole uh, field of atom density representations, where if you have an atomic point cloud and you have some atom in, in this cloud, then relative to this atom, it sees its environment in a particular way. So you, and you can encode this environment as a sum over all the particles in the systems, which are embedded in this spherical harmonic basis and with a radial basis function. So this sort of gives you a functional representation of, of the environment. And we're going to, we, we can use this ID to, to well, compute messages uh, between uh, particles and their states. And without going into detail there, I just want to mention that uh, a driving factor behind this paper or core ID is this idea of decomposing the energy of the entire system. So we have an energy of the entire system of particles uh, into a sum of energies between pairs of particles. So if we have all these particles with their uh, connectivity, we also have a, uh, you know, pairs of particles. So this particle is connected to that one, that to that one. And so we have to each edge, let's say we have an associated energy. And now the core elements of this graph neural network 
uh, in this paper, or maybe you shouldn't call it a graph neural network, I, I still think it is. <laughs> so the identities are not just the node features, the nodes themselves, but now the edges are of primary interest. And this paper is all about updating feature vectors that I can assign to each edge. So these feature vectors assigned to each edge. Um, yeah, those representations we want to learn and update in a neural network. And of course, this is going to be done in an equivalent way using this e 3 and library using steerable features because we have these pairwise atom embeddings in, into spherical harmonics. And yeah, you have to read the paper, of course, to, to grasp the full details. But what I want to do is go to the main layer. So I said they're updating the feature vectors assigned to each pair of atoms, to each edge ij. And they do this via a layer in such a way. So we have... Let's say this is a stable feature vector of a certain type. Then this is obtained from, well, the, the feature vector at the cur the previous state. So we have this point cloud, we have this uh, Vij. So let's say feature vector at layer minus one. And this feature vector, uh, this one, is going to be updated based on some environment embedding, based on the other, all other edges that are connected uh, to this one, including itself, uh, possibly. So that's what you see over here. The, the, the output of this edge ij is going to be obtained via, well, the previous uh, feature value and a weighted sum of these ik. So those are the, the other edges uh, uh, connected to this central node uh, i. And this, of course, needs to be done in an equivalent way. So this is the collapse code and tensor product, simply with this environment embedding and the current uh, node feature. And now the important thing is that this collapse Gordon tensor product is essentially weighted via this, this, this weight matrix or, or these weight coefficients. And these weight coefficients, they are in some way conditioned on all the invariant quantities that they have up, uh, until that point. So these weights, they depend on these, this vector of invariance. And this vector of invariance uh, contain, contains uh, the distances uh, between atoms, but also other, all other scalar values that I've collected so far. So this linear transformation, it really is a linear transformation. Collapse coordinate tensor product is, is linear, but it's augmented with these weights, which are obtained in a very nonlinear way. So this is really like a, a conditional, conditional linear layer. And it's like um, a very adaptive neural network where the weights are really changing with depth um, depending on whatever it has seen so far. And I really like this idea of, of this nonlinear uh, adaptive transformation where the, well, the linear transformations are conditioned uh, on something. Um, yeah, and, and so they are conditioned. So these, these scalar values are conditioned on whatever invariance I can pull out of my current um, stable feature vector, the invariance that I've collected so far and maybe augmented with a masking function that uh, depends on the distance be between atom pairs. Okay, so yeah, that, that's all I want to say about this paper. Uh, now, maybe one more thing is that it definitely pushes the state of the art by quite a large margin. Uh, again, for example, um, yeah, on QM9, it, it gets these results, which are really impressive, uh, I think. Okay, and now I don't want to discredit any other uh, papers. It's like, okay, this is now the new state of the art, but that's not completely true because I think on several benchmarks, Unite is even better. So this, these papers really push the state of the art uh, to, to its limits, uh, I think. And I'm really curious of what is coming next. And central here is, of course, that they work with equivalent quantities or covariance, and these transform via Klebsch Gordon tensor product. Yeah, so again, to wrap up, so I made a, a, a short overview or maybe not that short, sorry about it, of, of steerable methods. Um, and this analysis actually came from, from a recent paper. So maybe that's a good starting point, but obviously don't take this list for granted as being a, a complete uh, overview of the entire field. Yeah, so this video focused primarily on these uh, steerable uh, methods, both linear and, and the nonlinear uh, counterparts. And in the next video, I want to focus on uh, let's say that the non-zero or the, the message passing networks of the regular group convolution type.